Randy, you and I are both Darwinians, obviously, but you're a medical doctor and I'm not. Mm -hmm. It's always struck me that a lot of medical doctors don't seem quite to have caught up 150 years after the origin. Is that your impression too? They're all very interested once they find out about it, um, but very few doctors have had a chance to get an education in evolutionary biology, and boy, do I ever wish I had <laughs> yes. uh, when I was uh, to getting my medical education. There are so many things that would have made a lot more sense if someone had just really explained how natural selection works. There are some doctors who feel, well, all I need to do then is to learn about a lot of other animals as though I was a vet, but it's not quite like that, is it? No, we really need to know where they all came from and why they're all designed in ways that make things go wrong. So you use the word design there, and yes. um, we need, obviously, to interpret that in the special Darwinian sense of You know, design. I always end up using the word design, and someone in the audience always said, you shouldn't do that, Dr. Nessie, because yeah. uh, you don't really mean design, and they're absolutely right, of course. Well, yeah, but... We've grown out of that now, haven't we, or have we not? But when you look at how the mechanisms of the body work, it's almost automatic to talk about them being designed, but really gives the proof is when you look at how badly designed they are. No sensible person would have ever left the body the way it is. Like what? What's a good example of that? Um, name your part of the body that you want to. Um, probably a lot of people watching this uh, show have been on a skateboard. And, for instance, they fall like this, and they break these bones here. The doctors call it a Collie's fracture. If you look on the skeleton, it's these two bones fracture right there. Now, people have been falling down like that for you know a million years, or our predecessors have. Why didn't natural selection make these bones thicker? And the answer is this. We can do this marvelous thing of rotating our arms all the way around like that. I won't do it for this model because it's a Victorian skeleton that's quite <laughs> delicate. But notice how those bones go across oh, yeah. each other. If those bones were thicker, it would be more like this. Yeah. And then you yeah. couldn't throw. You, yeah. you, so it's a trade-off, isn't it? Now, this is something that any machine would be limited by. But when they make robots, they still are not using two different firm rods, usually. There's usually one that rotates. OK, so it's, a, it's kind of historical legacy, then. That's the other part of it. Yes, yes exactly. Historical legacy. We, the technical word term is path dependence. It's all the same. Yeah. Probably a lot of viewers have a keyboard for their computer. In fact, we all have what's called a QWERTY keyboard. And that keyboard was designed specifically to keep typewriter keys from sticking. And so they put all the vowels a fair way away from each other, so there was a little delay. Well, this means we all type slowly because our keyboards yeah. are designed to make us there type slowly. There are better designs of keyboards. There are. What's, what's it called? The Dvorak. Uh, yes. And keyboard. once you've learned how to do it, uh, y you go faster, don't you? You first. Uh, I would, if the, the time it takes exactly, to learn. Exactly, exactly. I, that, I will never do that. I, don't, I think the world may be stuck with yes. these mal-designed keyboards for another hundred years just because they started off that way and the cost of changing is too high for all of us so we're stuck with it. Likewise, there are all kinds of aspects of the body that might be done differently, but uh, we've gone down one particular path and can't get out of it. I mean, the example I like to use with machines is imagine if you had to evolve the jet engine from the propeller engine by changing it one little step at a time. Not possible. Get, or, or if you did, you have a pretty lousy jet engine. Exactly by, by so. What, what are other examples in the human body that are... The, the most dramatic is, is the human eye. Right. You know, it's held up as this example of perfection in the body. It's not perfect to guys. It's a perfect example of, of why the body is not designed. I mean, imagine a camera designer for a famous camera company like Nikon or Pentax who put the wires between the light and the film, which is how our eye is working. And not only that, our eye has a whole blind spot where nothing works at all. I I think th you know, do you know that every creationist has a blind spot? <laughs> I think it was Helmholtz, the famous German psychologist, who said if, somebody had, if an engineer had given him the human eye, he'd yeah. have sent it back. Indeed, yeah. indeed. Mm -hmm. um, I think viewers might like to see their own blind spots. Shall we demonstrate for them for just a moment? Okay. Yes. All you need. Um, to do the demonstration is a little pencil. You can do it just with an eraser, but this particular one has a little tiny red pin on the top. And what you do is cover one eye, if you would, please. And we take the pin and we move it right in the... And you have to keep looking right, right. at the bridge of my nose, so okay. keep your eye fixed. And now we're going to move it just out a little bit, about 15 degrees, and right about there... Yeah, it's gone. It's gone. Yeah. You can't see it? No. Now can you see it? Yes. Now can you see it? Yes. Now can you see it? No. There's a blind spot. Yeah. That's really lousy. Yeah. So what's amazing, though, about how natural selection has made the eye so it works despite this built-in flaw 
is that the eye constantly jiggles slightly. We call it nystagmus. And this seems like it's a problem, but it's actually a solution. Because if it wasn't for the eye jiggling constantly just a little bit, that blind spot would always be in the same spot. You'd never see anything there. But because the eye moves slightly, um, you end up getting a complete coverage of your field of vision. It is remarkable how natural selection manages to kind of clean up afterwards, isn't it? That's I mean, a lot of what it does. You start off it's with, stuck with things. With a, it's stuck with things for historical accident, but then the, the cleaning up afterwards is so good that it actually ends up a really remarkably fine instrument, despite it, its historical it, it's legacy. It's astounding, right. Yeah. I mean, with the eye, there are other things that happen later in life, like detached retinas, you know? Um, for us, as I said, all of the vessels and nerves come through that hole in the back of the eyeball. That's why there's a blind spot. And they spread out on the inside of the eyeball between the light and the place where the light is received, blocking the light. And that's why you have to have that little bit of jiggle in there. Uh, but that's for all mammals, in fact, all vertebrates. Not all species have this problem, interestingly. Mm -hmm. And if we can go over here to our octopus, I don't know if you can zoom in. All of the octopuses, the cephalopods, have an eye that's designed properly. There I used a design word again. Yeah. Um, their eyes have all of the vessels and nerves coming right through the back of the eyeball, so they can't get a retinal detachment. They never have a problem with the blind spot. They don't have to be moving the eye so much to get a complete field of vision. It's a better design absolutely entirely than ours. And the reason is, why are we so screwed up? Bad luck. Yeah. There's no right other the explanation yes. except it's bad luck. Nevertheless, we probably see better than octopuses do because our cleaning up has been has Or been differently, so you know. Yes. That, that's another example of trade-offs. For instance, uh, an eagle can see a mouse from half a mile away and we can't. Yes but they don't have the color vision we have, they don't have the field of vision that we have. Everything in the body, once you take an evolutionary view, is trade-offs all the way down. So you're kind of answering the question of why the body goes wrong, and there are all sorts of reasons why it goes wrong. What, what other aspects are there of Darwinian medicine that we know, doctors I, ought to I know I should emphasize that uh, this field really got going by a collaboration of mine with George Williams. Um, viewers may or may not know he's one of the more famous and, and worthy evolutionary biologists of our time. He Great taught us. Yeah. Right, right. And it's very closely related to your work on yeah. selfish genes, of course, because prior to Williams' work in 1966, most people thought that natural selection shaped species. Um, for their own good, and now we know that selection works much more strongly at the level of the gene. So that theme has infused a lot of my work with George Williams. But as we started talking in our collaboration about why the body isn't better designed, we finally narrowed it down to six possible reasons. Now I'm using the word design over and over again. I can, Go ahead. I, I, mean, can, uh, I can see why other yeah. people do, you know? Yes. It's very hard to find another word to refer to these mechanisms that work so well. I mean, once and for all, it looks like design. It Natural like selection produces a powerful illusion of design. They work. But you've just been telling us some reasons why it's actually not entirely a good analogy, because, because there are imperfections which no human designer would tolerate. Right. And maybe we should pause at this moment to ask if the body is a machine. Um, I was taught certainly that the body is a machine. I always used to say it was a machine. Yes, and, but that's a metaphor which is fundamentally wrong. Uh, the body is not a machine. Uh, it works very well. It has levers and pulleys and connections and all the rest. But a machine has blueprints, one master design, and a manufacturing process that moves from the blueprint to the finished or, uh, version, which is all the same. There are no blueprints for the body. There's a genome that has information in it, but some people imagine that the genome, that there is a normal genome. There is no normal genome. There are only genes. And those genes that make bodies that end up reproducing more than others they go on and become more frequent in the future. Other genes become less frequent and are gone. The genome is a collection of genes that work. It's nothing like a blueprint. Um, no, it's certainly nothing like a blueprint. I still think that in some respects it's reasonable to talk about the body as a machine. In other respects it's not. I mean, it's not designed. It doesn't have a blueprint. On the other hand, there's a mechanism which, I mean, think, uh, you know, a heart is a pump, an right. eye is, a, is a, an image-forming device with with all sorts of respects in which it resembles a camera, with an iris diaphragm that narrows down and so on. Right. I mean, it's kind of a machine, but it's a different sort of machine, and above all, it has a different history. And, yeah, exactly so, and the, the other evidence that it's not a machine is that a machine can be changed completely by the designer um, deciding to, to the drawing board. Right. 